Welcome to Ask Quinn, everyone. And as you know, I am getting my journalism degree. Yes, that's public knowledge. It's still happening. And I'll be graduating with my associate's degree in 2020. So I brought not one of my teachers, although I wish Mike was one of my teachers. I brought a teacher on of journalism so you could understand a little bit about what I'm going through because I always think it's nice to foster the um, next generation of journalists, including myself, because I am the next generation of journalists. And I don't know, Mike was previously the West Coast editor of a little magazine called People.com. So I don't know what that has to do with his love of education, but I'm going to let Mike take it away. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, I was the West Coast editor of People Magazine's website. Um, I was at People Magazine for 15 years. And then for 13 years before that, I covered uh, trials and the police uh, beat for the Associated Press. Um, so I've been a magazine journalist and an online journalist and a breaking news journalist. And for the last uh, four years or so, I have been a teacher, a college journalism teacher, and a, a freelance book, uh, magazine, and screenwriter. Um, so I get uh, the best of both worlds. I get to do journalism, get to do writing, and I get to teach it. Yeah, you get you get it all. And what made you go into journalism in the first place? because we all come from this philosophy of um, you've got to be a teacher, a doctor, a lawyer. At least that's the philosophy I grew up with. And my mother, I love her, but she kind of forced me to go into the jobby job world um, without a passion career, and when she passed away eight years ago, um, I basically said, I want my journalism degree, and now is the time to do it. And so, and so my first degree was in education. But what made you go into journalism and um, not go down this straight in the old path? Um, teaching lawyer or doctor? My my parents did not pressure me one way or the other. I originally intended on being a lawyer. And I went to college and uh, was majoring um, in rhetoric, um, uh, you know, argumentative writing and speaking, and with plans to go into law. Um, but I had always loved journalism. I was on the high school newspaper, um, and then I was at a junior college for a year before I transferred to UC Berkeley, and I was on the school paper there. Um, and I'd always seen it as an extracurricular activity, not so much a, a potential career. Um, but then I had a couple of very good and inspiring teachers at Berkeley, and they were both uh, working journalists um, who are teaching part time, and their enthusiasm for journalism was infectious, and they were living examples that you could actually have a career, that there was a way to do it. And journalism combined really two of my best loves, which is curiosity and creativity. I could be curious and creative for a living. Um, and so I decided to give it a try, and I, I went to uh, graduate journalism school at uh, Columbia University after I got my undergraduate, and then I was uh, hired uh, by the Associated Press 
while I was at Columbia, and, and that's what began my career. So you, let me get this straight. You were going down the typical career path of being a lawyer, and then you fell in love with journalism, veered off the path of being a lawyer, and then while at Columbia, you got a job. Exactly. So while while I was at Columbia, and it's a one-year program uh, for a master's degree, and one of my teachers, uh, he was a court reporter, covered trials at the Associated Press, and he just one night told the class that there were openings, job openings, at the Associated Press, and, and he encouraged us to apply. Um, AP was based uh, in Rockefeller Center, just you know, subway ride down from Columbia. So I went down there. I took a writing test, um, a spelling test, um, and passed that and came in uh, for an interview, and they hired me in uh, Newark, New Jersey. It's an unbelievable story because here I thought you were going to say I got my law degree and then went back to school. Oh, no. You said I'm going to do what I love and I don't want the law degree anymore. And then uh, the icing on cake is when you were getting your master's degree, you actually got a job out of your master's degree. Yeah, that, that would probably be a little harder now. Um, this was in yeah. the 1980s, and yes, the journalism, yes, yeah, the journal, yeah, the journalism business was uh, uh, a lot healthier and more robust um, in those days. Uh, but there are still people getting jobs, and many of my students uh, get jobs. And when I when I worked in Newark, Newark, New Jersey, right across the river from New York, um, I still got to kind of indulge in my love of uh, first love of the law because I covered trials. I covered um, civil and criminal courts uh, trials for AP, and I did that for many years. Okay, now I'm going to ask a tricky question, but I'm doing this because I'm selfish and I want to ask um, this question, and then I'll ask another tricky question for my own good here. Um, what would be your best advice to the next generation journalist, i.e. me, to get a job in the journalism field? Because when I met with a job coach um, at the Academy of Arts, they, and I met with her via phone, she goes, when you cannot get a job in um journalism because of this political climate. And I said, well, isn't something to do with me? Let's face facts here. I have a disability. So if it's something to do with me, tell me. And she goes, no, because of this political climate and because a certain person keeps calling every journalist in a book fake news, hint, hint, and you can't get a job in journalism. So, like, is that true, or was I just talking to a job coach who's not inspiring people to go search for jobs in their field? Well, I have good news and bad news. Uh, let me start with the bad news. I We have to be realistic. Um, the job market for journalists is uh, is not good. Um, and it has nothing to do with Donald Trump. It has to do with the fact that people are not buying newspapers the way they used to. They're not buying magazines. They want it all free on the Internet. And so there are economic forces that are making the job market tighter. But um, I think the fact that the president is, is bashing journalists and saying things about fake news is not an argument against becoming a reporter. It's an argument to become a reporter. I yeah. think that shows, yeah. that shows oh, why we, oh, yeah. that shows why, yeah, why we need, need dedicated, 
hardworking journalists. Those are anti-democratic, anti-First Amendment um, um, statements, and somebody has to challenge challenge that. And that's the kind of the core responsibility of a journalist is to hold the powerful accountable. And so the less accountable they are, the more you need journalists. So um, I think uh, this person is wrong. I think the exact opposite is true. Yes, it's harder to get a job as it's harder to get a lot of different jobs, but the world needs journalists. And I think the world's going to yeah. even need more journalists. And uh, I, I think if you have a passion for it and an aptitude for it, you will find a way. And I don't know if you guys remembered this, but I certainly did because it impacted my life. And this was when I was in a different college trying to get a business way. And when this hit news, I thought, oh, if something ever happened, I would get a journalism way. And, of course, something did happen. I got kicked out of college because I didn't keep my grades when I ever got. And so I um, went off to get my journalism degree. But the thing that really struck a chord with me is when Donald Trump was getting elected, he was at a campaign rally, and he said to the effect of that reporter could remember what he just said. And he started, Donald Trump started making fun of that reporter, and that reporter was in Virginia. But stop the icing on cake off, he, the reporter, had cerebral palsy. And I'm like, oh, boy, oh, boy. And I was sitting there watching this as a woman with cerebral palsy. And I'm like, I almost screamed at the television, journalism, here I come, because I want to be the diverse journalist that I can be and still hold the responsibility of a journalist. I think journalism needs people who scream at TVs. I think journalism yeah. needs people who have yeah. passion. Yeah, Mike. Yeah. You know, yeah, we, don't need people, we don't need people who want to be famous or want to be, you know, TV anchors or, or who want to get their own reality show. We need people who care and who are passionate and who are angry and who who are willing to to do something about that and aren't worried about money, fame, and yeah. fortune and, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, no. Because that may come, that may not. No, but it's, it's, it's still a public service, and uh, I, I think it's a, a very high calling, and, and uh, I, think it's worth, uh, I think it's worth fighting for. Yeah, and I'm going to be fighting for it um, to the end. And so what has been your favorite subject you have ever taught to your students? Um, I I think my favorite subject would be feature writing. Um, I teach that at I teach that at night at UCLA. Um, I teach it as an online class, so my students take it you know at home online. I don't actually go into a classroom, um, but I like teaching feature writing because it combines um, all the skills of a hard news reporter. Um, with the skills of a novelist, and uh, you get to be a writer in addition to a journalist. You get to be creative. You get to try new things. Um, it's what I did for many years at People Magazine, and I've written a number of books, so I've, I've, I've you know, been able to uh, apply that um, in my own career. And it's, so it's, it's the favorite, my favorite kind of, my favorite kind of writing to teach. Well, if I, um, after I get my MFA, which I'm going to, after I get my associate's degree, I might have to um, do a little investigation into UCLA on the line and do your, um, do your feature writing class and actually become a student of yours. I'm not kidding when I say that because 
I I have not experienced speech to writing yet in my degree, and that being said, I may have to ask my program, do they offer that? Because um, that sounds fun to me. That sounds fun. I like the um, creative aspect of journalism. I don't like these. Um, right now, I'm actually finishing up a class, and all we did was, well, I can say all we did, because that's not true, but the main portion was news, scripts, and in the so national videos, and I did not like that because I don't like news clips and informational videos. I never looked at anything in my life. So um, I learned a lot um, from my teachers. Thank you very much. But I did not like the news clips and the informational videos. So I have to stay away from the journalistic field in that. Right, that's why I could never become a broadcast journalist, nor a newspaper journalist. People ask me all the time, why don't you write a fashion column for the um, local newspaper here, which is Aspen, Colorado, by the way. And I keep saying to them, no way, no how, no way, no how, no way, no how. I am not um, following the rules of the newspaper. Plus, this piece of journalism is dying, so that's not happening. So you um, you like the more creative side of journalism. And so what has been the best piece that you have written in your career? And I know I asked you a tough question there, Mike. Oh, my goodness. Um, I mean, I've been a, a writer for over – 30 years um uh i so it's hard to say because i'm too close to it i all i look at when i read my books and my articles are the mistakes that i made i don't look at them as uh for where they're good um uh but i mean i've written uh, i've written some books um that i'm very proud of um and i would say i'm most proud of not a single story, a single article, but I covered the O.J. Simpson trial um, uh, when he went on trial, and I covered that for the Associated Press. And I think uh, we did a pretty good job. Um, we were up against a lot of different forces, and it would have been too easy to be sensational and, and uh, you know, uh, go go a different way. But I've, I've gone back and I've reread my articles that I wrote at the time, and I think, uh, you know, they were accurate and they were fast, but also we put them in social and historic, uh, historical perspective and, and, uh, they were balanced and they were fair. And, uh, so I'm, I'm pretty proud of, uh, my OJ Simpson coverage. But let me just say this. This is before we had Google, you guys. This is the, the OJ Simpson trial was in 1995, before we had a high-speed internet, before we had cell phones, before we had Google, which a journalist should not Google to help with their research. They need to be a little um, more discreet in Google. Then um, I learned that the hard way. I learned that the hard way, and I actually, by accident, because I was not thinking, I actually um, took something off Google and accidentally pasted it into a discussion board. My teacher um, caught me, and I did not get kicked out of my program, but I learned my lesson the hard way, so never Google. But I was going to say that the O.J. Simpson trial happened before we had all this technology. I mean, I remember my dad watching the trial on a VCR. A millennial doesn't know what I'm talking about when I say VCR on tape. Thank you very much. So Mike was looking at trial without the luxury of technology. 
And so for my kid to look at that file without the luxury of technology must have been our speed. It was um, a challenge, but um, I was working at the Associated Press, covering it for AP, which is a wire service. And it's very similar, very similar to a website today um, because we would cover the news as it happened and we would update it sometimes minute by minute for radio stations, for TV. And so we were constantly updating our stories and constantly filing and constantly revising. And the trial was also telecast live, so everybody was watching it in real time. So in some ways it was very similar to what we had today. I had to write a lot of stories, and and everybody was watching the same thing I was. Um, And so I had to bring some expertise and at the same time keep it fresh and, and updated. Um, but I, I can only imagine, or can't even imagine, I should, should say, what it would be like in the age of Twitter and Facebook and social media and, um, you know, uh, all the stuff that's going on today. It was, it was crazy enough at the time, and it would have probably been even crazier today. Yes. <laughs> yes. That um, trial would have been nuts today because of Twitter and news feed on Twitter. And hint, hint, that that's all Mike and I met via Twitter. And so that yeah. Tim and Twitter wouldn't have mixed back then in nineteen ninety five when that um trial actually happened because you're getting all the journalists to um uh, say their journalistic opinion on a news scene, i.e. Twitter, that goes fast and furious, and it's like, really? (laughs) So it would have been insane to do um, OJ on Twitter, to do OJ today on Twitter. Insane. Insane. So I'm happy that you didn't have to do with it. And so, Mike, what is your best advice as we tie up this interview for anyone that's stuck in the cubicle, let's say, at the Associated Press, to get their butt out the door, to get outside the cubicle, but still do what they love, which is journalism. What is the best advice to become a freelance journalist, or is it the best advice to have the best of those worlds? be in the teaching field um, with the W-2 and do freelance work on the side. I mean, what would your advice be? I mean, you worked for um, a couple major outlets, people.com being one of them, and then the associate class, and then you went to one of the top schools for your master's program. So what would be your best advice? Um, my best advice is the advice I give to all writers, and that's that's something that uh, you'll hear. This is something you'll hear over and over again. There are two kinds of writers. There are the kinds who talk about writing, and there are the kinds who write. And I know it sounds obvious, but writers write. And there are a lot of writers who talk about writing, a lot of journalists who talk about journals, they talk, 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 but they don't actually do it. Because it's hard. It's hard to write. It's hard to cover a story. And I teach feature writing. To me, the hardest writing of all is covering fashion. I can't cover fashion. I can't describe a dress. I'm terrible at it. It's very hard to do. Even what they would call, quote, unquote, frivolous writing is hard to do. You have to be observant and descriptive and know your subject matter and be able to be able to relate it to somebody. You have to do it. And the good news is, the one piece of good news in this crazy job market is that there are more outlets for this than ever before. You can write. You can be a journalist. You may not get paid, and you may not be at the New York Times, but you can write an article, and you can get an audience. And keep doing it. Keep doing it. Stop talking about it. Just do it. And the more you do it, 
the more you learn, the more mistakes you make, and you learn from your mistakes, and you find yourself, you find your place in this crazy world. Journalism is changing by the minute. It's impossible for me to give advice that would be relevant five years from now. I just can't. I don't know what the state of journalism is going to look like. But I do know this. The world needs storytellers. The world needs people who can take complicated information and make it understandable to other people. The world needs people who can hold the powerful accountable, who can who can tell stories, who can entertain and 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 illuminate and break down and, and make some sense out of everything. And there's really no excuse to not do it. The business end of it, like I said, it changes every minute. But my feeling is if you work hard enough at it and you like doing it enough and you're passionate enough about it and you're willing to make mistakes and, and, and learn from your mistakes, you will find your way. You have to get in front of the terminal in a blank screen and start typing. It's the hardest thing on earth to do. And once you can do that, then I think there's a, a bright future for you. Well, I appreciate you saying that. And the reason why I started laughing is because you brought up my degree, and I am actually getting a fashion journalism degree. And for um, some of you, you can um, do well in fashion degrees, but in other um, avenues, you can't. So what I'm going to end up doing is I'm actually, after I finish this way, I'm actually going to end up with my MFA, so I hope, in creative writing. For those of you who said, what George Indian would just use Masters in Creative Writing, MFA. That's what Masters in Fine Arts emphasize in Creative Writing. That's what I just said. Mike understood my jargon, but you guys didn't. So I, because fashion journalism is such a niche beyond niche, I thought, well, why not expand my journalism journey into a bigger niche? So I have a better chance of getting paid for journalism because um, unless I'm looking at people.com, I don't think my degree is going to hold to the fire, honestly, and I'm being honest with you guys. And so before I let Mike go, I am going to let him ask me a couple questions about anything, about journalism, about about anything. Well, I think my, my biggest question is if you could write right now any story, what would it be? Any story? Any story? If you had, a, if, if you had an unlimited budget right now and, uh, and they said, here's uh, all the money and, and resources you need, what would you, what would you do right this minute? I would love, 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 because um, this person actually did it. I would love to interview um, Tommy Hilfiger specifically on his disabled fashion line. I would absolutely, that would be a catch me out if I had unlimited resources and that would be a catch me out because he did a disabled fashion line. I, I would just love to get inside his brain because a lot of fashion designers are not doing that. Thank you very much. And so I would love to get inside his brain and just say, why did you do this? What do you think is making an impact? Why? Just ask him why. Because I um, actually featured him in one of my homework assignments, and I would love to ask him why he decided to take the challenge on of dressing the disabled, really, of dressing the disabled. And you guys, if you type in Tommy Hilfiger, the adaptive, lo- adaptive line, you guys will see what I'm talking about. 
And that would be the ultimate dream for me to um, use my degree, interview a uh, ultra famous fashion designer, and speak about disability. That would be the ultimate dream. So my follow-up question is, have you asked him? No. <laughs> no, and I probably should. I, yes. I knew you were going to say that, having you asked him. No, and I probably should um, contact. I'll probably, I'll probably do that. In the moment I say that, you guys, someone will probably hand me his press line and all um, my... My second, you see, you caught me, Mike. The power of Twitter. That's um, that's what that's what I have to get on. Now that I put this out to the universe, I have to now get on it with you. Um, you asking me that question because, and I have to get on the UCLA thing because I want to be one of your students. I want to put that out to the universe that eventually I'll be one of your students because you are just as passionate about journalism as I am. And so we need more passion journalists. We need more people of diversity in um, journalism. And we need people that scream at television. I'm sorry. I love that Why I'm going to use it. Like we need people that scream at television because we can't have bumps on logs in journalism. We can't have people that don't care. <laughs> well, I think you could very easily make that dream come true. I think it's a modest dream. I think it's not a dream. It's a stepping stone for you. And yep. uh, uh, 50% of journalism is figuring out how to get access, and then the other 50% is just doing the work. And I can let you in on a little secret. It's not that hard. It's not that hard. You just have to be persistent and creative and a little bit of a pain in the butt. And you could uh, probably, you could probably well, get that I already interview. have. You could probably get that interview. Again, ask, but so. I, I will. And I know that now that I put that out to the universe, <laughs> it's so funny that I actually interviewed and she still is. She's not doing it anymore, but she was a uh, adjunct professor at the Academy of Art. And I said to her on this podcast, I said to, she's in the fashion space, um, doing journalism in the fashion space. And I said to Lori Sanderson, um, I want to go to the Academy of Art in um to study fashion journalism. I put that out on this podcast. Do you know I made that happen? So when you say stepping stones, I'm going to make my dream interview happen. And you guys are going to follow me on this journey because with the power of technology and the power of Twitter, you will be amazed what you get out of a journalist. Well, after you talk to Tommy Hilfiger, um, why don't we uh, do another interview? And I'm, I'm eager to hear I would that. love that. I would love that. And you guys are going to follow me on this journey. And you guys are just going to see me, I guess, blossom as a journalist. And this is why I love interviewing as a journalist because of um, – Everything they have to teach me. I mean, my program teaches me every single day, but um, doing journalism in the outside world is better than in a classroom. And I appreciate Mike coming on this podcast. And for those of you who are at the gym and can't follow my show notes, you will have more information about Mike in the show notes. And I appreciate him sharing his journalistic wisdom with all of us. And you guys got to see the other side of my life, which um, now, since I'm 30% done with it, I can take a sigh of the relief and 
breathe a little bit and share with you how tough it is to be a journalist. But with Mike and I and all the other journalists out there, we can do it and we will do it. It's just a tough journey, but we will succeed. And so thanks you guys. And thank you, Mike, for coming on this podcast. And I hope you guys enjoy another episode of Ask When. Thanks, you guys. So long.